So I was quite tempted to be controversial this morning, just to make sure everyone was actually awake and paying attention. Um, I'm not sure that I am, but if I am at any point, then hopefully um, we'll get to see whether you're awake or not. Um, so what I wanted to do... Here we go. Sorry, bear with me. Of course, as a programmer, technology is bound to fail every time I try and use it. Okay. Um, so I wanted to highlight some key moments in the history of open cultural data, particularly looking at points where things change um, and thinking about why things change, rather than just going through a whole list of this happened and then that happened. Um, so I'm going to look at some of the changes in standards, in um, sort of movements and releases of data, um, but also conversations and collaborations. And then I'll close by looking at some of the lessons learned. Um, and I wanted to make it clear that there's I probably have a bias um, uh, towards the English-speaking world, towards the antiquities in my case also, um, and I work mostly in museums um, and with historians. So if I've missed anything, be the change. Go in and edit those documents. <laughs> um, one is um, Lottie Willis put it together for a paper she's giving at museums and the web, um, but it's a nice general resource in terms of um, sort of significant moments in cultural history. So now you're not going to be paying attention because you're editing, which is, you know, not a bad thing. Um, so open cultural data, just to put it really simply, it's data from cultural institutions that's made available in a machine-readable format under an open licence. Um, and I know that each of those terms is um, potentially contentious, so I just wanted to unpack them a little. Uh, often in the museum world or in the glam world, they'll regard something as being open if it's released under a non-commercial licence. And I don't have to tell people in this room here that that can cause all kinds of problems. Um, but glams, sort of innocently, naively, don't know exactly why these things are problems. They don't understand necessarily that non-commercial is such a sort of ambiguously defined term that it's all but useless. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is have these conversations and explain that non-commercial is a kind of tricky term, and I think there's some of the tensions around um, commercial use because glams are told they should be exploiting their content. If someone comes up, someone else comes in and exploits it, um, which I know is a loaded term in itself, then they fear that they'll be told, "Why didn't you do that?" Never mind the fact that they're not startups, that they're not makers of apps, really, that they're not in a position to do this. Um, they're in an environment where almost anything they do is going to offend either the government or the Daily Mail or Wikipedians. Um, so they can't really win. Um, so open might refer to the licences that allow reuse. You don't have to ask for permission to use content. It might refer to the technologies and standards used, whether they're non-proprietary or whether you need API keys or whether you, um, the conditions under which you can access that content. Um, ideally, it refers to a combination of both open licences and technologies um, and open standards, but, you know, we don't always get that. Okay, so GLAMs also sometimes release their data under custom licences, which, again, they do it in all good faith, but don't realise that it makes it really hard to kind of remix content down the, down the path or to um, aggregate it with other content that's licensed under a different set of rules. Um, because they, they're not developers necessarily and they don't have those kinds of use cases in mind. So we have to help them understand the implications of the choices that they make. Um, and also GLAMs really value attribution. To them it's a way of not only crediting the collecting history of inst the institution, it's also a form of provenance of data um, that says this was created by an authoritative source. Um, it's not purely ego, although in some of the cases of the National Museums I'd say, there's a bit of ego in there as well. Um, so we have to help them either understand how Wikipedians as a community can value some of the same things, those moral rights around it, linking things back to the source institution, um, without helping them understand that we speak some of the same language. And I weirdly say we to mean both Wikipedians and museum people. Um, I think in the discussion yesterday, pandas, glams are pandas who live, female pandas who live high in the hills and Wikipedians are pandas who live in the the foothills and no one really meets, um, and I think it's a kind of genderqueer panda somewhere in between that perhaps <laughs> everyone in this room is now officially a genderqueer panda. Sorry about that. You didn't expect that, did you, this morning? Okay, so cultural is probably the sort of the easiest term to define. It's data about objects, publications, it could be books, pamphlets, musical scores, posters, it's archival material, 
Um, it's any content that's created or distributed by museums, libraries, archives, and other organizations. Um, and we kind of get into what that data actually is. Um, it's really useful at the start of any conversation with anyone about this to talk about whether you're talking about metadata, whether you're talking about content, as in the images, whether you're talking about the kind of interpretive, descriptive text that contains a lot of research, um, but might also have been written 50 years ago for an entirely different context and actually turn out to be a bit dodgy now. Um, and whether you're talking about the kind of, sort of the tombstone data, which is really this kind of, from this European image, um, it's, you know, when was it taken, when was it acquired, um, who was the artist, just that kind of really basic level stuff. Um, so we've got a range of kinds of content, from full digital surrogates of glorious high-res images down to really crappy records, um, which mostly tend to say things like pot sometime in the Roman era. Um, and that's actually quite literally how crap a lot of museum records are. But, so sometimes when you say, give me the data, um, you don't really mean give me all the really crappy records. But it's not until museums give them to you that you can say, actually now I understand exactly how crappy that is, maybe you could keep that to yourself in future. So a lot of the content isn't immediately interesting. It needs other people to take it in and to do something interesting with it. And I think there's also an interesting tension around material culture as a primary source. And I know the primary sources on Wikipedia are meant to be something that anyone can look at and understand how it's being used to make an argument or to, to back up, to provide evidence for something. Um, but for a lot of content that's in libraries, archives and museums, unless your 18th century paleography is reasonable, um, a handwritten document isn't necessarily going to help make a point, um, and the kind of contextual interpretation that we need to make around historical documents and material um, isn't immediately obvious um, how that translates into Wikipedia. So perhaps there's an interim stage where we turn that content into something more useful. Because not everything is glorious, wonderful images. Often it's 800 records about really crappy, broken oil lamps. Not that I'm bitter, but it is. Um, so just, you know, why do we care about open cultural data? Um, I think it's the foundation on, upon which many projects can be built. It helps achieve organisational goals for um, museums, for libraries and archives, who are about knowledge, who are about access to the world's heritage and history. Um, we can start to create a network effect. The history of collecting institutions is this weird history of often strange men who went out collecting. <clears throat> if you've ever seen the Welcome Collection, you'll know exactly um, how this works. He just kind of randomly collected all kinds of things. Um, there are still crates that haven't been opened. So collections are sort of distributed across the world, they've been taken from the countries in which they originated, um, and we can use this kind of network effect, we can use open cultural data and sites like Wikimedia Commons, Flickr Commons, Wikipedia, to start to bring these um, items back together again and kind of recreate the story, um, rather than trying to tell it through the collections of any one institution. Um, and I think open cultural data is just really important to help other people share, who share your goals, work towards those same, those same goals around knowledge and information. So I just wanted to look at some key moments, including some things like funders, <coughs> legislative influences, um, the commercial sector, because they're the context in which decisions are made, um, and they have an effect on what glams and what Wikipedians think is possible. Even journalism has been a key driver in the movement for open data. Um, the sites like the, the Guardian's call for to free our data in 2006 had an influence. Um, sort of grassroots political projects like They Work For You um, in so 2004. They've all kind of helped create an environment in which open data is seen as being part of, the, part of citizenship. Um, and just to give you a sense in the growth of linked data, I don't want to go into the whole linked open data versus open cultural data issue. But these slides represent the growth of linked open data since 2007. So you can see there's a kind of really exponential growth. They stopped updating this in 2011. Um, but they went from 12 linked data sources in May 2007 to 295 in 2011. So you can only imagine how many more there are now. If we're not, as glad as if we're not in this cloud, then we're nowhere, because this is where people go to get information. This is how the world constructs its own knowledge in a digital sense. Um, oh, that's 
interesting screenshot. Um, the 2001, so Tim Berners-Lee having sort of gone on to invent, previously invented the web, um, started to write about the evolution of the next stage of the web, um, to calling it the semantic web. The idea isn't entirely new, but the kind of marked the beginning of a movement towards um, structured data online that could be used and reused in different ways, that could be reused creatively. Um, and also in 2011, some small project called Wikipedia was founded. I don't know if that did it ever go anywhere. Yeah. Um, and moving on in 2004, the Wikimedia Commons was founded. Um, so things kind of went nascent for a while. Um, glam sector certainly moves quite slowly. Um, the Tim Berners-Lee in 2006 introduced the concept of linked data, and because museums are so hip and cutting edge, they got around to having a semantic web think tank. Um, so they're only about five years behind, which, you know, isn't too bad. Um, but it was museums getting together to start to, to think about what they could do, how they could release structured data online. Um, and there's a bit kind of parallel conversation in terms of cultural heritage technologists, who are the people in museums, libraries and archives who are often change agents, but because they're technologists, um, aren't really represented in the kind of directorate level discussions in GLAMS. Um, but they're the ones who kind of know what's going on and who are often pushing for change. So they're allies um, for any kind of project that you want to do. So the BNA is probably the first museum to offer its images free of copyright um, and free of administrative charges. Um, and they kind of <coughs> took a liberal attitude. They kept commercial licensing for their images, but they took a liberal attitude in terms of what scholarly use was um, and what educational use was. Um, museums notoriously like to be the third on their block. Very few museums like to be the first. But when you've got a museum like the v &A doing something like this, it makes it okay for almost every other museum to do it. Um, because it, uh, museums work by um, Someone tries something, and if no one dies, then they'll try something else. Um, so it's a story of slow, iterative change. Um, but it all kind of adds up and has a cumulative effect. So by, by 2007, we started to see content being added to the Wikimedia Commons from a variety <coughs> of sources. Um, and there was a real kind of movement around um, people taking a deep breath and sharing their content, or releasing or donating their content. In 2008, um, the Flickr Commons project launched, and I think it's really instructive to look at the differences in how GLAMs view things like Flickr Commons and Wikipedia Commons. Um, they have similar licensing restrictions, so um, the Library of Congress was able to release content saying that they have no known copyright restrictions. Um, and that became the model of the licenses for the Commons. Certainly for museums that I was working at at the time, they really, really wanted to be part of it, but they had a lot of orphan works. Um, so works where the license holders are unknown or the copyright status is unknown, um, but particularly for sort of gorgeous photographic collections. Um, they're too recent in a way to really, to, to say they're in the public domain, and also they often depict living people. Um, <coughs> so it's a kind of tricky issue. Then, the requirement to go as far as to say there's no known copyright is something that UK institutions struggled with a bit. Um, so in then 2008, the Powerhouse Museum became the first museum to join the Commons. Um, so we started off with libraries and we've moved to museums and there are about 56 participating institutions. Um, there's a backlog of people waiting to join the Flickr Commons. Um, and of course, any content that goes into Flickr Commons can also go into Wikimedia Commons because it's released under that license. <coughs> but the kinds of interactions that GLAMs have with users on these platforms are quite different. Um, and I think they find the level of interaction on Flickr more engaging um, and somehow more personal. Because museums are really about relationships and audiences. They're about collections and knowledge, but what really matters to them is knowing that those collections and knowledge are making a difference in someone's life. Um, so, the Europeana prototype launched. I'm assuming I don't have to explain what Europeana is. Has anyone not heard of Europeana? Do it for the record. Oh, good lord. <laughs> um, okay, so they're an aggregator of metadata from libraries, archives, museums across Europe. Um, they index content. They don't actually hold the content themselves. 
um, they'll point you off to find content on the originating institution. The background is actually the European Digital Library, um, and as a geek, I can kind of trace that lineage through their metadata schemas because they um, were much better at dealing with books than they were at dealing with kind of Neolithic objects. Um, so European was proposed in 2005. Um, they began work in, work in the prototype digital library in 2007 and launched in 2008. Um, and European has really driven work to standardise formats and metadata. Um, they've made a lot of things possible in Europe that might have happened a lot more slowly otherwise. And then at the other end of the scale, you get countries like New Zealand, Finland, you know, these countries that do just get on with things and produce really amazing things. Um, so New Zealand, for some countries that are quite aware of their place in the world, New Zealand has four million people, famously more sheep than people. Um, so a site like Digital New Zealand helps make their content easy to find, to share and use. Um, okay, so Tim Berners-Lee again. Um, he did a TED talk, and for some reason it seems to have been a pivotal moment. It kind of spread in a way that all the conversations that poor little museum nerds, archive nerds were having didn't seem to make the same impact. Maybe if we got people up and chanting raw data now, um, then people would get into it more. Um, so, yeah, his TED talk, and possibly because it's in a really accessible format, so shiny and glitzy as well. Um, also in 2009, the UK and the US governments both launched their data.gov or data.gov.uk sites. So they're really kind of normalising this idea that publishing your data, that transparency is a really good thing. Um, in 2009, Brooklyn Museum launched the first API from a museum. Within a few days, they had three projects built in their API. Um, there's an incredible response that I think is a kind of pent-up energy um, and desire that people had to get their hands on this data. It helps that Brooklyn Museum has a gorgeous, gorgeous collection that ranges across space and time. Um, the museums that I work in tend to be more sort of social history or technology-led. Um, so they had mobile phone apps, iPad apps, code libraries for other people to use. Um, also in 2009, the Powerhouse Museum um, released its collections of metadata, so just the kind of tombstone um, information, under a Creative Commons CC BY um, SA licence. So the content could be used for any use, including commercial use, as long as it was distributed and as long as it was shared under the same licence. Um, they released their museum specific notes, so these kind of extensive notes on the significance of objects, more interpretive contextual information, um, for non-commercial use. One of the interesting things about this is that at the time they credit it, the final push came from a Wikimedia backstage tour. Um, so that moment where they could actually put faces to the Wikipedians, where they could realise that everyone gets excited about the same things, um, those moments, those conversations, those face-to-face -face encounters seem to be really powerful in, in these movements. Um, also in 2009, we had the first Glen Wiki conference in Australia, um, really aiming to discover how cultural institutions and um, Wikimedia could work together and what each might need to do to start to work together. Um, the event resulted in, they had recommendations under four headings, legal, technological, education and business, um, including recommendations for what became the first um, Wikimedia in residence program. Um, some of the talks that I've seen in the program today and that I heard yesterday are updates on the issues that were first raised then, I mean, that would obviously been raised before, but, but having that conversation in a shared space I think is important. So things like toolkits, stats, um, license advocacy, you know, the quality of editing interfaces. Um, so all these things are still, still ongoing, but those conversations I think are really important. <coughs> There was another set of significant conversations um, before the Museums and the Web Conference in Denver in 2010, um, which is possibly the first time I met some of you. Um, so again, issues like metrics, um, you know, how can we help museums, libraries, archives justify the investment in digitization? Um, the issues around the primacy of material culture and original research in memory institutions um, compared to Wikipedia's needs, um, 
the issue of significance, whether something is worth keeping in a museum store or worth keeping in an, an archive box because there's a cost to keeping objects, um, versus notability. Not everything that a curator thinks is wonderful is actually notable. Um, so it's just moments like that, getting together in the same room and working out where you come from that can really make a difference. Um, and I think there's glams and Wikipedia can often, um, they have roles at different stages of the knowledge production process. Um, and input from glams becomes knowledge on Wikipedia. Um, so that's a, things that neither of us can really do on our own, we need to work together sometimes. Um, being in the British Library, I should mention that they released their catalogue metadata in 2010. And we heard yesterday that this was a moment that helped change the organisation's attitude um, to data. They went from being closed by default to being opened up by default because they had a positive experience when they did this. Even though something like, I'm not going to offend any librarians in the room, but lists of books isn't necessarily the kind of thing that you would think would be valuable, but there are so many users for it. Um, and by releasing that data, they're engaging in that conversation and taking part. 2011, um, <coughs> Yale opened up their image library. For an institution like Yale, which if you work with art historians is sort of really prestigious, um, it sends a really powerful signal to the rest of the world, but it also shows that they're thinking cleverly about what their core mission is. Their core mission is to create, preserve and disseminate knowledge in digital form. Their core mission isn't to spend time worrying about the hordes outside the door. Um, as we heard about the Rijksmuseum yesterday, um, the content's going to be out there anyway, so they might as well concentrate on making sure it's the best content it can possibly be. Um, so they were really thinking about this as a service to scholarship. Um, and some of the images I've used later on come from that collection because it's just really lovely to be able to think of a keyword and try and find a painting to match it. Um, also in 2011, the um, British Museum launched a linked data service, um, so they're a proper semantic web or linked open data service. Um, and one conversation that's not necessarily represented here was the Lod Lamb Summit, so linked open data in libraries, archives and museums, um, where 100 international attendees met in San Francisco. But the important thing about that is they, one of the groups came up with a four-star open data license which really was a chance for GLAMS to think through the implications of non-commercial use and put it into their own terms. So that became something that you could take back into GLAMS and they would understand it as opposed to um, the language that was written more for people who were already convinced about the benefits of open data. So there's a kind of translation role. Everyone in this room is hopefully not only an ambassador, but you're also a translator. You're translating the concerns, the language, the jargon um, from one domain into the other. And okay, in 2011, Europeana launched an API providing machine readable access, so scriptable access to over 20 million objects from 1,500 museums. Um, I don't know how much credit we can, I'm looking at David Haskett, um, how much credit we can give the sort of critical friends in the GLAM sector um, who kept asking for an API from the moment Europeana was announced almost. Um, but I'd like to think those conversations help make a difference even just in terms of demonstrating that there's a demand if you invest in creating an API, people will start to use it. And then in 2012, Europeana released their metadata under CC0. Um, so, um, today we've got lots of open data, we've got um, lots of conversations going on, we've got Wikipedians embedded in GLAMs, we've got GLAMs editing content. Um, We've got the National, the Digital Public Library of America launches next week, I think the 18th. Um, it'll be interesting to see what impact that has because they've taken on all those values of openness and sharing and access. So a lot of these, this change, this history of change is the result of years of conversations, years of collaboration. Um, so change is slow, but it does happen. Um, and I've said that GLAMs work through slow iterations. They try something. Um, they wait and see what the reception is, and then they do something else. So I think the reception that people here give to those, those changes is important because it does inform what happens next. Um, so there's a lot of tensions that GLAMs face. I said they can't do anything right. Whatever they do, someone is going to pick on them. Whether it's a front page of sort of a rabid 
tabloid, whether it's questions asked in Parliament, whether it's trustees coming down on the CEOs, whether it's Wikipedians demonstrating outside their doors. Um, they're asked to do these really contradictory things, and they're asked to worry about imaginary things, like potential loss of income. Um, income that you might be able to generate from your collections if circumstances were different. It's like saying, you know, you could have met someone amazing on the tube, but they were in a different carriage to you. How can you possibly make a case that says, you know, you're up against a phantom? Um, so we need to work with people like the government to help them understand that open data is a contribution to the creative economy, to the digital economy. Um, it's not something that individual institutions should be trying to do for themselves. I'd like to think that Wikipedia helps make people smarter. So releasing content that Wikipedians can use is a contribution to making the world smarter, even though it's not happening in your own doors. Um, Glams also worry about reputational damage. Um, you know, what if they release data and someone else uses it commercially, or someone makes a Nazi flag out of it? Um, but there's an almost a release in the sense of changing your mindset from it being data that you are the sort of have sole responsibility for to data that is part of our shared heritage, a role in being the custodians of shared heritage, um, collaborating with other people to make that open. Um, okay, so conversations matter. We're all working towards the same goal. We've got different anxieties. We've got different ways of um, thinking about the problems of the world. So GLAMs have the rare advantage of being able to see people walk through the door, and as someone who mostly works on web stuff, it's brilliant because I can guess what web users are like, but I don't necessarily know except through looking at analytics. I can see what people in the museum like because they start screaming in excitement, um, mostly the kids, but occasionally adults. Um, but GLAMs are also, they're kind of really used to these relationships, they're used to people asking things in person. And because they have status in the world, they're used to being wined and dined. Um, and I think one of the biggest tensions I see is that glams are expecting that kind of, you know, a bit of flirtation, a first date, and then you lay the hardware on them. Um, but when you're used to an online world, you just kind of go in there and wham, bam. And that freaks them out. And they, you know, where are the flowers? Um, so I think it's really just a call for empathy and it's a call for understanding that the world is changing around glams. Um, conventions are changing around glams. Um, they're just catching up with text speak, let alone with anything else. And possibly the most important lesson to take from this is that trust is a currency. Um, and as ambassadors, we all are responsible for maintaining that trust. Um, and we're responsible for what happens if we blow it. And that goes for both Glams and for Wikipedians. <coughs> um, so I think attitudes matter. And one of the ways that attitudes can change is someone else, a higher power, coming in and telling them they must change. So even Digital New Zealand, um, you know, they've pushed things a bit further because the government has an open access policy um, and a licensing framework and an open government initiative um, and a data reuse program. So they're putting, not only changing the values, they're changing the funding structures. Um, they're helping organisations change by giving them some context for change. And I think governments can also help GLAMs open up by identif identifying them against the chance that someone else will monetize their data by saying it's part of the greater good, um, to help them deal with orphan works. Um, museums, galleries, archives, they're inherently conservative. They find it quite terrifying to say, we can put this online. Um, and if someone writes to say, actually, that my, my grandmother's in that photo um, and she's picking her nose, so could you take it down, please? Um, they're not quite used to the idea that immediate takedown um, can help rectify those situations. They're kind of used to process that take 50 years. Um, okay, so I suppose what I want to do is just celebrate how far we've come. So things that are better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Obviously kittens, um, clearly puppies as well. Um, but I think also cultural data that's available online but that isn't yet openly licensed. Um, it might not be available for reuse. It might not yet be available for use on Wikipedia but it does still have value because you can still have an experience of that content and learn from that knowledge. So not everything that GLAMs are doing is ideal, um, but it's certainly better than nothing. So GLAMs and Wikipedians may move at different paces, they may have different priorities, different ways of viewing the world, um, but we're all working towards the same goal. I sensed yesterday that there are still some tensions between Wikimedians and GLAM people 
Sometimes it's moments when we need to take a deep breath and not blurt out the first thing that comes into our mind. Um, sort of putting empathy over the pity you put down. Um, but I really love that in Kat Welch's Welcome Yesterday, she talked about how Wikipedians used to focus on how different they were from others, but now it's about reaching out. It's about finding similarities with others and figuring out what you have in common. So labs and Wikipedians have already used open cultural data to make the world a better place. Um, so let's celebrate the progress that we've made and let's keep working on that. Thank you.